Good morning and welcome to the Mosaic Company's first quarter 2023 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants have been placed in a listen-only mode. After the company completes their prepared remarks, the lines will be open to take your questions. Your host today's for to, excuse me, your host for today's call is Paul Masood, Vice President of Investor Relations and FP&A of the Mosaic Company. Mr. Masood, you may begin. Thank you, and welcome to our first quarter 2023 earnings call. Opening comments will be provided by Jock O'Rourke, President and Chief Executive Officer, followed by Q&A. Clint Freeland, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and Jenny Wong, Senior Vice President, Global Strategic Marketing, will also be available to answer your questions. We will be making forward-looking statements during this conference call. The statements include, but are not limited to, statements about future financial and operating results. They are based on management's beliefs and expectations as of today's date and are subject to significant risks and uncertainties. Actual results may differ materially from projected results. Factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those in the forward-looking statements are included in our press release published yesterday and in our reports filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We will also be presenting certain non-GAAP financial measures. Our press release and performance data also contain important information on these non-GAAP measures. Now, I'd like to turn the call over to Jock. Good morning. Thank you for joining our first quarter 2023 earnings call. Mosaic delivered revenues of $3.6 billion, adjusted EBITDA of $777 million, and adjusted earnings of $1.14 per share. The fundamentals of the agriculture market remain quite attractive. Global stock-to-use ratios for grain and oil seeds are at 25-year lows. To put that in context, it would take two to three years of perfect weather and adequate fertilizer applications in every major growing region around the world just to get back to normal levels. With weather patterns shifting to an El Nino environment, the likelihood of that happening is low and would be exacerbated by under-fertilization. We are beginning to see the negative impacts on crop production. Yields in the European Union turned lower in 2022 because of poor weather and under-fertilization and will remain under pressure this year if fertilizer applications remain down. We're seeing a similar story in rice. The combination of El Nino and under-fertilization could further threaten yields in key growing regions. With reduced supply of sunflower seed oil because of the ongoing war in Ukraine, the global market needs alternative edible oils, and is looking to palm oil as an important substitute. Lack of fertilization, particularly potash, will impact Southeast Asian production. All of these factors are expected to support global crop prices for the foreseeable future. Switching to fertilizer markets, farmer affordability for phosphates and potash globally is very good, with prices that are much more sustainable than the levels we saw a year ago. This is bringing growers back into the market, though supply constraints are still a concern. In potash, Belarusian exports remain limited because of sanctions. We've seen volumes moved by rail into China and to a lesser extent through excess Russian port capacity. But transportation costs are high and total exports remain well below pre-sanction levels. This year, we expect total exports from Belarus to be roughly 7 million tons. In addition, we also continue to see indications of reduced Russian product as well. It is clear that today's potash market is tight and supply chain is under pressure, but this extends beyond just Belarus and Russia. This vulnerability is highlighted by the recent failure of the walkway on a conveyor at Campa, Texas, 4 million ton per year Portland terminal. Campa, Texas is still assessing the total damage but expects to redirect much of the lost volume to other North American ports, albeit at some additional cost. In phosphates, China remains committed to a structural shift away from exports. While it's possible to see a modest increase in exports over the 2022 total of 6.4 million tons, domestic fertilizer demand, rising industrial consumption, and environmental restrictions will cap China's shipments to other markets. These supply constraints remain, even as demand in our key customer markets is seeing a recovery. In North America, spring planting season is well underway, and farmers have returned to the market, though retailers have been slow to adjust their prices to global wholesale market prices. Despite that resistance, 
Growers are still committing and taking tons. Retailers are replenishing their inventories. In April, Mosaic's volumes saw a significant rebound in the North American shipments. For both potash and phosphate, combined, Mosaic shipped over 1 million tons of potash and phosphates to North American customers in April alone. This is the highest total we've seen in the last five years. In Brazil, the barter ratio is supportive of demand, and we expect commitments for the third quarter to ramp up with prepays for fertilizer ahead of the safra season. We expect Brazil will see a 9 to 10 percent increase in fertilizer shipments in 2023 over last year. In India, inventories for potash remain depleted, as all purchases are going straight to the ground. After a year of reduced potash applications, a potash contract was signed in April at a price of $422 per tonne. In addition to providing necessary supply to Indian farmers, the contract helps stabilize global pricing. In Southeast Asia, with the shortfall in edible oils globally, the palm market is driving strong demand. Globally, we're seeing good farmer economics, which suggests strong demand for phosphates and potash in 2023. Given this landscape, we believe our business is well positioned to benefit from today's market conditions. In phosphates, after two years of production issues caused by multiple hurricanes, raw material shortages, and other issues, the segment's performance has improved. Volumes during the quarter were higher than any quarter in 2022, and our stripping margins also benefited from lower raw materials costs. We expect both of these trends to continue in 2023. In the second quarter, we anticipate total sales volumes of 1.8 to 2 million tons with DAP FOB prices at the plant in the range of $550 to $600 per ton. In potash, volumes began to move over the last week of the first quarter, and that has continued into the second quarter, especially in North America. We expect demand to continue recovering throughout the year. Our operations at Esther Hazy and Bell Plain are performing well. Esther Hazy is one of the most efficient mines in the world, and Bell Plain should see benefit from lower natural gas costs in 2023. At Esther Hazy, the last of the 13 miners is expected to come online later this year. In total, Esther Hazy's annual operational run rate should increase from 5.5 million tons last year to well over 6 million tons by the end of 2023. We're committed to producing enough potash to meet market demand. With the incremental output from Esther Hazy, we believe we're producing what the market needs, which means we'll only restart Klonze when it's needed. We don't think this will be before the second half of the year. In the second quarter, we expect total sales volumes of 2 to 2.2 million tons, with MOP prices at the mine in the range of $325 to $375 per ton. In Brazil, first quarter results reflected the impact of declining prices and inventory destocking. As we said in February, we expected our Q1 results to be impacted by destocking of high-priced inventory. And now that is largely behind us. Looking ahead, we expect distribution margins to trend back towards the range of $30 to $40 a ton. In the second quarter, 90% of those tons are already committed and priced. Finally, I want to reiterate that we are committed to our capital allocation strategy of maintaining a strong balance sheet, investing in our business, and returning capital to shareholders. We've met our commitment of reducing long-term debt by $1 billion. As such, we expect to refinance the $900 million that matures later this year. Our CapEx spending expectation this year remains unchanged at $1.3 to $1.4 billion. We're focused on high-returning, modest spend projects like our distribution facility in Pomeranchi, expansion of microessentials at Riverview, and the exploration of purified phosphoric acid. Beyond that, all excess free cash flow will be returned to shareholders through dividends and share buybacks. During the quarter, we returned $608 million, which included $456 million of share repurchases and $152 million in special and regular dividends. Over the last 18 months, we've repurchased 15% of our float and still believe our shares represent very good value. 
Our regular dividend today is $0.80 cents per share, and our business positions us to consider further increases over time. Before we move to the Q&A, let me summarize. The global ag market remains constructive. Grain and oil seed supplies are tight, and growers are incented by favorable economics to apply nutrients. We are already seeing the recovery in shipments in North America and expect the rest of the world to follow. Our production operations are performing well, phosphate production has recovered, and potash is benefiting from the most efficient mines in the world, with swing capacity available to meet demand growth. Our balance sheet is strong and sustainable over the long term, and we remain committed to returning significant capital to shareholders while continuing to invest efficiently in the business. With that, I'd like to move on to the Q&A portion of the call. Before we move on to live Q&A, as we've done in past quarters, we'd like to address some of the most common questions we received after we published our earnings materials last night. Chuck, the first question that we received was, how do we see ag markets evolving over the rest of 2023? Thank you. While there has been recent volatility in the agricultural markets, the fundamentals remain strong. We're starting with a 25-year low stock-to-use ratio of four grains and oilseed. Now, much has been made of Brazil's larger-than-expected crop, but offsetting that is problems in the Argentinian, Europe, Asia, and others who are suffering from lower yields due to weather and under-fertilizations. Then, as we look at going forward, this year's El Nino and under-fertilization brings up a real risk to the 2023 ag markets. Now, weather is always a known uncertainty, but as we've seen in recent past, extreme weather events that negatively impact ag production seem to have become more commonplace. Longer term, we do continue to see great potential for demand growth from biofuels, including an increased call on oil seeds to feed renewable diesel production, as well as the enormous potential for sustainable aviation fuel. We also believe that Biofuel use will continue to rise in the medium term, even as cars transition towards electrification. To sum up, there is a rational basis for ag commodity prices to have eased off in recent weeks. However, there is strong fundamentals for ag bullishness. Jack, a follow-on to the ag markets question. How do we see what you just said impacting fertilizer markets over the rest of this year? Well, thank you. I'd like to start by saying what we're seeing in North America demonstrates just how strong the market could be this year. If we look at North America in the months of March and April, those were both very strong months and up about 20% from where we were probably last year. So if I look forward there, I expect that will carry over to a stronger season in Brazil once the Safra application gets started and then it will continue for Asia and other regions. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Jenny to give a little more detail on the supply and demand of the fertilizer markets. Sure, Jock. Let me start from phosphate. The export control out of China is going to continue. As the country is going through phosphate industry shift from production on fertilizers to industrial products. The Chinese government is going to continue to ensure their farmers to have affordable and available fertilizers in country for their own production. The export restriction is going to continue to be in place. We believe this year the export out of China will be somewhere between 7 to 8 million tons. With the tight supply of phosphate and the rebounding demand, we believe this is a very constructive margin environment for phosphate. Turning over to potash, export out of Belarus last year had significantly reduced from 12 million tons to 5 million tons. This year, despite multiple export corridors being utilized by Belarus, we still don't believe that they have opportunity to export over 8 million tons out of Belarus. And the production out of Russia is continuously under the risk. On the demand side, as Jock mentioned, we are seeing a very strong spring season in North America. In the market when the spring applications have started, we're seeing a bigger volume went to the field, 
and we have seen price appreciation in the market. And in the market in Northern Plains, where the spring season are still ongoing, we have started to get inquiries from our customers for their summer fuel demand. This demand to summer fuel and fall application are indicating a strong and robust demand for the fall season in North America. We believe what is happening in North America is going to happen in a market like Brazil, where they are going to prepare for their incoming seasons, and we believe they will engage soon. With a strong demand in Asia, we believe the buyers will re-engage and the price and volume will respond positively. Thank you, Jenny. The next question is a follow-on to what we just talked about. Given this constructive outlook on the fertilizer markets, can you explain your thinking behind the guidance for pricing and volume, particularly for potash? Thank you. In potash, we guided to a normal quarter in North America and a conservative view of the export market. Early quarter demand in North America is stronger than we would have expected and certainly stronger than normal. And history would say that the strong North American market will be followed in other markets such as Brazil and Asia. If this occurs, there is certainly upside to both potash volume and price. We have seen over and over again that once volumes move, price follows. Jock, our next question is on Mosaic for Lozange's results. Could you provide more color on the quarter and how you see the performance of the segment evolving over the rest of the year? Thank you. In the distribution business, the lead time to position products is quite long. As such, when the second half volumes were lower than we expected, we ended the year with high-priced inventory. Now, we have sold most of this higher-cost inventory down and expect the rest of the year to be much more normal. Transitioning between cycles can temporarily expand or contract margins, but through cycle margins remain unchanged. For example, in quarter four of 2022 and quarter one of 2023, distribution margins were below historic levels, but they will return as market stability is achieved. Distribution margins in second quarter to the fourth quarter will be in the $30 to $40 range when averaged together. You know, Jack, one, one other thing that I would note that I think is important in this discussion is that we use average cost accounting for the cost of inventory in Brazil. And what that means is, is that as prices, sales prices are moving either up or down, the average cost of inventory that we're recognizing in our results is moving a little slower than that market price. And as a result, during increasing price environments, you'll see expanding margins. During declining price environments, you'll see declining margins. But that's why over the course of, you know, the year, we will see margins in the target range that we've talked about. But quarter to quarter, as market prices are moving, you can see a level of volatility in results. Thank you, John, Clint, and Jenny. Operator, let's move on to the live portion of the call. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. In the interest of time, please limit yourself to one question. At this time, we'll pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question comes from Christopher Parkinson from Mizuho. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, could you just give us a real quick update on how we should be thinking about your you know, phosphate strip margins just across you know, Florida raw cost processing, um, you know, where sulfur is trending relative to last year, as well as your, um, you know, ammonia mix. Just any insights on how that should affect uh, phosphate margins throughout the balance of the year would be incredibly helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, good morning, Chris. Thank you. Uh, if we look at uh, how we're projecting, I guess, uh, stripping margins for the rest of the year, you will have seen that the raw material prices have declined in the last while. Um, and obviously, you know, I think I've talked before, the sulfur, it takes 0.4 of a ton of sulfur basically to make a ton of DAP and about 0.2 of a ton of ammonia. So those, those moves, which have been quite material, 
have allowed, even though the price of phosphates has come down uh, in time, the actual margins have stayed relatively constant uh, throughout that period. And we see those margins staying relatively constant through the rest of the year. If, if we look at our cost of our actual inputs, rock and, um, and conversion, our rock costs were driven a little higher this, this quarter, basically because of a, a lower volume uh, throughout the quarter, probably due to both, um, well, more than anything, due to the grade of the area we've been mining through. And then if we look at uh, conversion costs, those have been impacted by higher variable and fixed costs such as electricity and process chemicals. For the balance of 2023, uh, we believe our, our maintenance and capital assets that we've invested in should really improve both volumes and costs as we move forward. Our next question comes from Steve Burns from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Thank you. Your, your mind gate, um price for potash for the second quarter uh, looks like it's roughly $75 a ton more than historical levels, and yet it sounds like Jenny's comments would 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 suggest that potash is the one that is going to be more curtailed in supply in in uh, 2023, as opposed to your FOB DAP forecast is is a couple hundred dollars higher than historical prices. So my question is, what is fundamentally different here between P and K that would lead potash pricing to to be generally weaker? Is is it is it a reflection of of a second tier price coming out of Russia. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, let me let me go through a couple of points there. I, you know, I think what I said earlier in the prepared questions or whatever the early questions uh, still holds, which is when we were setting up the quarter and doing our our preparation for this. You know, you're you're talking a couple of weeks ago. We hadn't seen fully the impact of of what we would see in April and May or sorry, March and April, we're seeing that come in better than we expected. Um, so from a volume perspective, we're pretty confident that that, um, that guidance is at least very realistic and probably even, you know, we could, we could see upside on that. In terms of pricing, it's all about a combination of what's going to which market, for instance. It's product mix, whether we're selling the... Um, standard grade product to some of the foreign markets where the where the prices are a lower and the uh, transport is higher but then secondly uh, you know how much is coming from North America which is a strong market and a good you know both good pricing and uh, relatively lower uh, transport and then Brazil which really hasn't started yet so as we end the North American spring and move into the, or you know, wind down the North American spring and move into uh, the quarter, our question is going to be: Does Brazil come in to replace the higher cost or the higher priced North American product, or do we get more of a balance on other exports? In which case, it, it just makes it a little hard to come up with a real good forecast for those prices. But I, I think that the comment you make is more than valid. There is definite tightness in the um, potash market. Uh, we're seeing it probably strongest through North Africa. We're seeing it strong in, um, in Europe. And I think we're going to see the impacts of it in Asia. So, you know, our view is they have to step up soon and start buying and the price will follow. Our next question comes from Ben Thur from Barclays. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's actually actually is a good follow up just on on the price development and like long term versus versus short term. So if you think about all the comments you made around the the structure challenges and and obviously the tightness, potash you just reiterated, uh, but still prices are not coming up that much. Um, so maybe help us understand a little bit that in context, pr 
crisis being soft, but then at the same time, you do consider some of capacity increases um, towards the back half of the year. So just to understand a little bit the rationale behind the volume um, you plan to put in additionally, uh, given where prices are. Yeah, sure. Uh, so if I'm if I'm going through uh, potash again, it, it's it's the same story. You know, first we're going to see North America. Uh, we didn't see a strong, although we don't sell to it, we didn't see a strong European market. But very quickly, we're going to turn over to Euro to um, Brazil and Latin America. That market should start moving. The saffron season starts basically at the start of the third quarter, if you will. So they have to be moving product towards the end of this this um, this quarter. So June, let's say, it's, things have to start moving to get product in place in time. Now we're coming into the year, and, and you know, I think one thing that has to be understood is there was some pretty severe overshoot last year. Uh, price went high, uh, usage went way down, and I think we're seeing an overshoot downwards right now. And so it's not following fundamentals, but long term it has to. So Brazil and the rest of Latin America will start moving. China is a very similar season to North America. And while they are getting more product from Belarus and Russia across from rail, they're still going to have to buy by potash. So, so all of that stuff starts moving. Asia has to move. They need their, you know, their staples uh, like rice to, to grow. Uh, Indonesia, Malaysia needs the palm oil. So all of those start moving. Uh, we, we think it's still a constrained market. And the, the short-term, you know, sentiment drives short-term fundamentals drive the longer term. So uh, we think right now it's just sentiment driven. The next question comes from Andrew Wong from RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, just a couple of questions around phosphate for me. Um, what are your expectations for phosphate segment um, production run rate? Can we get back to what and historically, we've seen kind of two, 2.2 million tons per quarter coming out of that segment. Um, and then just a question on the Q2 um, pricing guidance. Uh, yesterday, we kind of saw um, U.S. NOLA DAP prices drop down to kind of like the low 500s. How did that factor into the price guidance for Q2? Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll let um, Jenny talk a little bit about summer fill and, and whatnot. But let, let, me, let me start by the run rate. You know, I think realistically our run rate's probably been a cl lot closer to 8.5 million tons per year since we shut down the plant city operation. So, you know, 2.2 is probably at the top end. I think a good quarter for us will now run probably 2 to 2.1, but we would expect an average uh, probably in that range as, as we go forward if, if everything is running well. Um, you know, we've had, as I mentioned in my prepared remarks, we have had weather-related issues. Hurricane Ian shut us down for, for a fair bit, um, caused some real problems. Um, so we, we think that that number of, you know, say 8.5 is a better run rate than, than let's say, 9 to 9.5 with all things sort of settled and looking at the possibilities. Uh, let, me, let me talk get Jenny to talk a little bit. I think what you're talking about is summer fill uh, pricing on, on phosphate. So let me get Jenny to talk about that. Sure. Um, Angela, I, I believe uh, the numbers that she talked about was DAP NOLA barge price. Um, we noticed that as, as well. And as some of the trade publications reported, this uh, uh, lower prices um, may be uh, driven by uh, the incoming um, import vessels the traders play on the index setting. So that's what we learned and that happened many times in the past. It does not necessarily represent the real um, market value. Um, as we go through this index setting, we will see the real value to be reflected for summer fuel. Having said that, um, it is very normal for the, for the market like North America. After spring season, we, will see, uh, we might see a price reset. It happened usually um, in, in every year, um, but the price eventually is going to be supported by fundamentals, as we discussed earlier. Lastly, um, we want to remind ourselves when we say um, phosphate market, it is a very constructive 
constructive margin environment. As the raw material prices are coming down, uh, there are some pulls through uh, to the to the um, phosphate prices as well. And just you know, not, don't forget the ever never-ending logistics issues. I'm not convinced that product coming in through NOLA certainly isn't going to get there in time for most of spring. So it is about summer fill, not about spring demand. And as you know, the flooding in the Missis upper Mississippi has meant that's actually been shut down for a while, or was. Our next question comes from Joel Jackson from BMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Good morning, Jock. Um, Good morning, Joel. I did a bit of history, and I went back to some of the presentations you gave in November of 2020 when you were presenting kind of your look of all the segments going forward. So look at the Fertilizante one. And the Fertilizante one, you talk about Transformation 1.0, Transformation 2.0, where you can maybe add two to $300 million of earnings to Brazil, to Fertilizante, by your different synergies, transformations, whatever. Now, and that was off the base you're already achieving. You were achieving $30 to $40 a ton margins um, in 2019, 2020 already, and that's the guidance you're giving now a steady state. So I guess my question is, what's happened to all those opportunities to where you're now guiding to a $35 ton margin, the same margins you achieved 19 and 20 before you launched all these initiatives? Oh, let, let me start, thanks, Joel. Let, let, let me start by saying that is the um, distribution margin that we're referring to there. And, and you know, it's, it's important to kind of think about that in terms of the overall. If you think last year, I think in distribution we sold approximately, was it 6 million tons of distribution tons? So 6.5 million tons of distribution tons at, I think it was about $60 on average. So if, if you think about that, that's contributing 200 million of the, of the billion dollars. And I know I, I'm probably adding to the confusion of how hard it is to estimate what Brazil looks like, but the distribution business itself is a pretty small piece of the overall. We, we make about $100 million a year of uh, co-product sales, and we make uh, the majority from our, um, our actual production business, selling our you know, uh, MAP and um, feed, TSP, and uh, SSP. So those are the ones that are really the and, and right now, that market is moving pretty slowly. We're in an off-season, and so what we're seeing is a, a more-than-usual impact on um, co co um, margin by that distribution business, if you will. So I don't think anything is inconsistent with what we said in 2020. Our next question comes from Richard Garcia Torena from Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Great, thanks for taking my question. Uh, just want to touch on the guidance for pricing in the second quarter. Uh, the range reflecting a higher percent of lower priced export sales. Um, any reason for that in terms of, you know, why more lower cost sales if if demand's picking up in April and you're seeing it as well in May? Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, do you want to take that, Jenny? Yeah, I think it's uh, um, just want to uh, remind what Jock mentioned, uh, the guidance for the second quarter for potash price, it is a mix of different market between North America and export market. And in the export market, there are a mix of different, um, uh, different grades for different destinations. So for example, the price to Brazil are, can be very different than the price to go to India because of the freight differences and also the grade differences. So as we forecast to, um, uh, the second quarter, this is a combination of different price, different product rate, and different market. Very strong North America price. We believe it is going to be carried over into uh, second quarter. The mix of the market will have impact in the guidance. Yeah, and let me, let me re reiterate. I think somebody, may have been Steve Burns, mentioned that, you know, is, it, is this the aggressive behavior of the Russians and the Belarusians? And, Yes, in a very, you know, in the uh, in a less robust market, which we've been in for the first part of the quarter, 
they have a bigger impact. So in the export market right now, they're, they're being quite aggressive and um, they're having a bigger impact. But recognize they can't keep producing enough to impact the markets once they really start moving. The next question comes from Edlaine Rodriguez from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I mean, Jack, a quick question on philosophy. In the past 12, 18 months, I mean, product prices have peaked and have come down really hard. Like, is there anything that Mosaic or Campotex or the industry could have done to mitigate that volatility? I mean, this is something that has happened before where product prices get to those high levels only to come down really hard very quickly. Like, is there a better way to quote unquote manage the pricing? I mean, yes, product is a commodity, but it doesn't really have the same cost push aspect like nitrogen does with natural gas. I mean, product is supposed to be different. I mean, any insight you can provide in there is like, what's going on there? Yeah, thanks, Adelaine. And and look, from our perspective, the the huge price peak, the quick drop back down is certainly not how you'd like to see the markets perform. You know, and we, we were saying that last year, and I, I wouldn't change my view on that at all. If you think back to, and, I, you know, you've got to almost think back to the start of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, where you had, for instance, President Bolsonaro of Brazil was in Canada asking for more product. You had him in Russia talking to Putin, looking for more potash. You had this huge almost panic run on, on potash and, and phosphates as they're trying to make sure they had enough for the season. And the price got to the point where it was, you know, literally, at least from a psychological perspective, unaffordable. So people took what we've talked about as the potash holiday. Well, now you're seeing virtually the opposite, where you still in some markets and some of the retailers are trying to sell their high price product. They're resistant on dropping their prices to the market. So now you see overshoot on the downside. And yeah, unfortunately, you know, it's it's kind of that system. It's a the highs were too high and now the lows are probably too low. Um, it'll balance out again just like it did in 09. Um, but we have to get through the, the first phase of it. What could we have done differently? Uh, you know, we were aware of the risk, and we I think we talked about that risk in, in some of these meetings even. So, you know, what can you do? Do you try and uh, send more to those markets to make sure they're well supplied? We did that, but then of course when things slowed down, uh, there's, no, there's no way around it. So I, I'm not convinced that anything that the suppliers could have done would have changed the the overall outcome. Um, now this year, again, uh, we're trying to supply, and you know, as people buy, that'll start balancing out. As a reminder, if you have a question, please press star then one. Our next question comes from Joshua Spector from UBS. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. This is uh, Lucas Bowman. I'm for Josh. Um, I just had two quick ones. Uh, firstly, so on your potash volume guide for the second quarter, um, your tone sounds like you think North America is going to be up year on year. So if that's the case, and I kind of split out like what Campitex is doing then in the second quarter, what's implied, um, it's implying that's kind of down 15 to 20 percent year on year. So I guess, is that right? Um, why would it be down that much? taking less allocation there. Um, and secondly, just wanted to follow on from Joel's question on fertilizante. So maybe how do you kind of see the normalized mid-cycle EBITDA and fertilizantes now? And could you split that between distribution EBITDA and production EBITDA for us, please? Thanks. Yeah, okay, looks. Um, yeah, potash volume, I, I, you know, I think I said earlier, we, we have taken a relatively conservative view of um, international sales, and so yes, our our portion of of exports is is a bit lower. Um, and and when I say this, I mean, you know, we're we're looking right now, and um, 
I think what it would say is if North America keeps performing as it does, we'll be at the higher end of our guidance. Um, and if the international market comes back, we'll be at the higher end of the guidance. All I can say at this stage is probably there's, um, you know, we try to keep a balance, but there's probably a little more upside potential than there is downside risk at this point, it looks like. Although, you know, again, supply chain and everything else can become a risk in this. Uh, you can only move so much, so much product. Now, um, the second question. Oh, Brazil, yeah. And again, let me, so let me kind of highlight Brazil, if you will. Um, I think you can look at Brazil as being, you know, 50% of their earnings are going to be a production kind of um, economics. Now, you have to take into account the fact that they're, they're producing right in the market. So I think that one's probably 50% of Brazil's earnings come from that. 30% come from um, the distribution business and the rest comes from other things like co-products and whatnot. So that's kind of how we look at it. Um, and that's, you know, that's how we've, we've tried to uh, portray that business. Our next question comes from Jeff Zakakis from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, a couple of questions about Potash. India signed uh, a contract for six months instead of a year this time in Potash. Um, why do you think? Why do you think they did that? Why, why sign a shorter-term contract? Normally, China quickly follows suit after India signs a contract and, and maybe gets a twenty-dollar a ton better price. And as you said, the Indians signed at four twenty-two a ton down from five ninety. But the Chinese didn't um, sign a contract down $20 a ton. Um, what do you make of that? And um, it, do you have an expectation for when the Chinese might sign a potash contract? Yeah, so okay, thanks, Jeff. Look, let me start with India. Um, it was not India that drove the six-month contractor. It was the suppliers including Campitex, and I don't like to normally speak for Campitex, but I can tell you that uh, we don't think the fundamentals are such that um, the price is going to still be at 422 come six months from now, or at least we thought there was pretty good upsized potential. So that was the reason that was a six-month, not a year. Uh, in terms of China, and, and recognize, sorry, let me finish the India thing. The other thing with India, though, is it hasn't really taken off tonnage-wise because they haven't established the uh, subsidy program. So while there is a contract price, the importers are still a little bit leery because there isn't a, there isn't a, a subsidy guarantee for them, which means the NPK plants are taking what they need, but they're taking it hand to mouth. So it, it's a bit problematic and it's um, more of a political and subsidy issue than it really is the um, you know the on the ground demand in in China why didn't China follow I think there's a couple of reasons I think the first is they had the inventory that they needed for the short term and there's you know they're looking for when do they really need product and and recognize that some things have changed in China <clears throat> with 2 million tons coming from the rail across from Kazakhstan with, from Belarus and another 2 million plus coming over the Urals from Eurocali and, and the Russians uh, and then 6 million tons coming from Qinghai Lake uh, and that production, your, your seaborne needs while still there are less than they were before. So, you know, maybe we have to reassess what 2 million tons of inventory really means uh, because I think it'll last them a little longer because they're getting their basic needs. Now, having said that, I think by about mid-year, they still need seaborne tons. So I think there's still a place for uh, for them. But I, you know, I will say, and we've been saying this for years, the relevance of the Chinese contract is becoming less and less overall because they're less and less reliant on seaborne tons. 
Our next question comes from Vincent Andrews from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you and, and good morning. Chuck, I'm just trying to synthesize all the comments today about the market and price expectations and so forth in Potash with what are the sort of thresholds um, that you're anticipating crossing uh, in the back half of the year that would get you to turn Colance on? Is it that you're looking for a certain increase in price from here or is it, you know, you're waiting for China, uh, China to come back into the seaborne market or what is it that that you guys are watching um, to determine whether you're going to make that that decision or not. Thanks, thanks, Vincent. Uh, if 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 I'm thinking about Colonze in particular, and I know there is one at least a a sent question that said, you know, why are we talking about start restarting Colonze at all? And and really, it's almost been a timing issue that every month that goes by, Esther Hazy increases its capacity a little bit. To where I think you know now we're probably going to be well over six million tons of capacity at Esther Hazy in the second half of the year. We're going to be three million tons of capacity at Belle Plain, and so overall, you know, we've got nine million tons of of total capacity without Colonze. So I think you know where where does Colonze come in? I think if if the export market really heats up and you start seeing good demand from China, good demand from India, good demand from Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Brazil start moving and, and Latin America, uh, then you're going to start to see the potential for us to not only um, have the, the need, the inventory will get run down that we have at the plants and we may not be able to keep up with the nine and a half. Now, if that only comes in lackluster, Colonze probably doesn't run. So Colonze, it's not a, it's not really a price issue for Colonze because I think the profitability of Colonze would still be reasonably good at this level. But um, you know, I, I don't want to be stuffing product into a market uh, where there isn't a buyer, or we just actually destroy the market we're in. And you know, not unlike what happened. Uh, when BPC broke up. And so I think there's a, a good case to be careful about how we bring that new pr that other production on. It's sitting there. Uh, maybe we have a little excess capacity that we're, you know, the cost of holding it's high, but there's enough uncertainty right now that I don't want to, um, I don't want to risk not having it if that market comes back that strong. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Jocko O'Rourke for any closing remarks. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, let me conclude our call by reinforcing a couple of our key messages. The agricultural commodity prices are still elevated. This gives farmers strong incentive to maximize their yield and use fertilizer. So fertilizer demand is robust and volumes are starting to move quite strongly. Our operations are running well and our strong earnings and cash flow are allowing us to return significant capital to shareholders. 2023 is off to a good start for Mosaic, and we have a positive outlook for the remainder of the year. So with that, thank you for joining our call. Have a great and safe day. The conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect. Today's presentation, you may now disconnect.